Uh, this is a quick lecture on chapter two, uh, the science of happiness, subjectivity, uh, and the subtitle of the view from in here. Uh, Gilbert starts off talking about three different kinds of happiness, uh, but in the end, the only one we're really concerned with is emotional happiness. And emotional happiness, he gives a couple of examples and things like that. Um, but in the end, the definition on page 41 that we're going to use is a, a subjective emotional experience uh, described as pleasurable or enjoyable. So emotional happiness is any time that we say we are enjoying something or we get pleasure from something, then we can say that that's um, emotional happiness. Um, and we do seem to spend a lot of our lives trying to uh, get that kind of feeling. Um, when we talk about whether or not we are happy at a particular moment, we tend to compare our current feeling of emotional happiness with our memories of our past happiness. We can't possibly compare uh, happiness at two different times with the actual feelings because we're no longer in those moments. So we can only compare our current feeling of happiness, how happy am I right now, compared to my memory of how happy I was uh, last week or yesterday um, or 10 minutes ago. Uh, the problem uh, is that memory is unreliable and, and Gilbert goes on throughout the chapter to show us uh, through various experiments, which you should take notes on, um, how bad we are at remembering things. He shows us that unless we're paying very close attention, we miss a lot. And um, later in the book, he's also going to explain how not only do we miss a lot, but we construct memory um, based on all kinds of you know heuristics and, and shortcuts that means that memory is not that accurate. Um, and he talks about the concept of perceptual narrowing, where uh, especially when we are focusing on one thing, we can totally miss... Uh, other things, and I'll, uh, there are a couple videos on the website you can look at that are examples of perceptual narrowing um, and um, change blindness. They're two of, because you have perceptual narrowing, uh, which means that your perception is so focused on one thing that you don't focus on anything else around you. So maybe watching this video, you're focused on me and you're not noticing the, the stupid drawing on the whiteboard uh, in back. Change blindness would mean. Uh, you're so focused on me that you don't notice that something in the background has actually changed while you were focused on me. Um, and for, because of both of those things, uh, we're pretty bad at remembering things. So when we try to compare two memories or two types of happiness, we're pretty bad at it. It's just, we can't trust it. It's kind of inaccurate. Um, then he goes on to talk about the language squishing hypothesis. Um, and the language squishing hypothesis, um, it's the idea that that uh, everybody gets the same amount of objective happiness from any particular event, but if you haven't experienced as much happiness as I have, then you talk about it differently than me. So we both have cake. Um, you say, this is the greatest cake I've ever had in the world, and I say, well, it's okay cake, and the reason I say that is because I've had even better cake, um, and you are really excited because it's the best cake you've had up to this point. And the problem with the language squishing hypothesis is that essentially it's it's very um, it's judgmental. It's uh, it tends to dismiss other people's experiences and other people's feelings as less real. So that you, you that you're experiencing happiness from the cake is somehow less less valued than my experience of happiness from the cake because I've had better cake than you in the past. So um, we can sort of can sort of reject that way of, of thinking about uh, uh, happiness. Every experience uh, we have does change the way we rate um, our happiness at every other moment and in the future. So to that degree, it causes us to actually contradict ourselves. It causes us to rewrite our past. So I have a piece of cake and I think this is a great cake. I love this cake. And if you ask me at that moment, I'm telling you how happy I am. I'm really happy then a week later I have an even better cake and I'm like wow this cake is amazing I love this cake and then you say well what did you think of the cake a week ago did you really enjoy it and I'd be like well no I guess I didn't because this cake is so much better so I am now rewriting my past experience even though I was happy in that moment but now I'm telling you that I wasn't um, and that's what new experiences do. They sort of cause us to have uh, incorrect memories. And the experience stretching hypothesis 
um, basically suggests that um, it's more uh, it's sort of the different, it's the alternative to the language squishing hypothesis, and it takes this idea of experience stretching to say, well, no, every moment where you say you are happy is true. Every moment where anybody says they're happy is, is equally valid, and it's just different because they have, even if they haven't experienced uh, the same types of things that I have, it doesn't mean that they are not happy. People are happy, um, and they may be happy because they don't know what they're missing, and that's the experience stretching that might go on later in their lives, but it, they are still happy. And so he sort of ends the chapter by saying, no matter what you say, if we're going to talk about happiness in this book, we're going to have to go with the assumption that all claims of happiness, even if they're from one person's point of view, at one person's particular time in that person's life, they're equally valid. And so if we're going to measure happiness, you know, eventually that's what we're going to have to measure one person's opinion of their own happiness at that point in time. We're going to have to say it's equally valuable as any other person's measure of happiness at that person's point in time.